When talking about sin, we all have done actions that we are ashamed of. We all have things in our past that we wish we could take back. And the same can be said for historical figures. One of these figures, whose character and conduct reflects a bad and questionable moral compass, is the man named Muhammad, who is seen as a prophet for over 1.8 billion people. When discussing the sexual perversions of Muhammad, like the consummation of his marriage with a nine-year-old, Aisha, taking his adopted son's wife for his own, and having well over the authorized number of wives that his own religion implemented, let alone ignoring the standard that was placed by God for marriage in the Bible, being between one man and one woman, one might get the idea that Muhammad was using his status as a prophet to satiate his carnal desires. In order to justify the repugnant decisions of their prophet, Muslims will attempt to turn to the Bible and select moments within the scriptures that might demonstrate a lack of moral integrity for the figures represented, acting as though the Bible is endorsing said decisions. Here, in response to the attacks that are perpetuated by those of the Islamic persuasion, this channel has documented some of the common attacks used, while providing answers from the scriptures which we will go over in this segment. After this analysis, we will close with our conclusion. Let's not waste any more time and get started. Abraham went outside of God's will by obeying Sarah's demands by asking him to have a child through Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid. Ishmael, the child of Abraham through Hagar, was not the child of promise, and when Isaac was born, the promised child of the Lord by Sarah, Hagar and her son were instructed to leave not only by Sarah, but by God. Ishmael's line was not given the same blessings as Isaac, which included the land of Israel. All this is to say that Abraham stepped out of line, and the Bible does not document this as a good thing on his part. After escaping the absolute destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's daughters had made him drunk in the pursuit of burying children with him because they thought he was the last man alive. God never once asked or permitted this to happen. Lot's daughters went outside of God's will, and their offspring ended up being enemies of Israel. This is considered wrong in multiple areas including passages like Leviticus 18 verses 6 to 7 where it reads, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him, to uncover their nakedness, I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father, or the nakedness of thy mother, shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Abraham in Genesis 22 verses 20 to 24 was given word that his brother Milcah had his own children. From that point on, it lists his children and their generations afterwards, including grandchildren. We can assume that this was over a long period of time and Abraham was only then receiving this news. It never said all these children were born that year, let alone the future wife of Isaac, Rebekah. In Genesis 24, Rebekah meets Abraham's servant who was sent out to find a wife for Isaac. The servant had 10 camels as detailed in verse 10. Verse 15 details that Rebekah was carrying a pitcher of water upon her shoulder must have had adult sized shoulders. Finally, verse 20 documents how she went and pitched water for all 10 of his camels. 
Now, I have never seen a three-year-old do that. Unless, of course, it is in the land of make-believe where you are trying to justify your false prophet being with a nine-year-old. In which case, you can go and strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Or, in this case, ten camels. In Numbers 31, but also found in Numbers 25, the women of Moab and Midian had caused the Jewish men to sin, where it reads in verse 16, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord in which this trespass is fornication and orgies. Those that were to be killed, according to verse 17, were the women who had perverted the men of Israel, men and boys, to avoid future rebellion, and to take quotations, women children, and keep them alive as found in verse 18. In Deuteronomy 21 verse 11, in relation to taking captives for wives, among the many prescriptions which includes having the woman to be given the opportunity to bewail her father and mother for a whole month, along with the option to free her at any time, says, And seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. It is clear that her attributes are to be that she is mature, and does not say that she is a child, as distinctly shown in verse 18. At no point did it say within this passage to take these girls as wives or to force themselves upon them especially since the women of these lands had caused issues with lasciviousness and perversions already, which shows that the interpretation of Muslims is fabricated and is adding to scripture. King David went outside God's will with the seduction of Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. After David had done this, God sent Nathan the prophet to tell David what he had done and that his son would die as a result of this. With this one exception, David was seen as a righteous man, and this was the only thing that God held against him. 1 Kings 5 verse 5 says, Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. King Solomon went outside God's will when he had as many wives and concubines as he did, in large part because they had led his heart away from the Lord. As found in Nehemiah 13 verse 26, did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. At no point did God say that this was okay and that this is a sign of outstanding moral character. The Song of Solomon is about a married couple expressing their love for one another. The inclusion of this book is not for the sake of arousal, as one who has actually read the book would understand as it is a poetic book that uses symbolic language and is a typology for Jesus and the Bride of Christ, also known as the Church. Read Ephesians 5 verses 22 to 33 for a better idea. The controversy with this is within Psalm 18 verse 10, as it reads about the Lord, and he rode upon a cherub, and did fly. 
Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. The preconceived notion of cherubs are that they are little naked babies with wings. But if a person was honest, they would ask, where in the Bible are cherubs described as that? Answer, nowhere. Descriptions are found in the Bible of what a cherub looks like. Read Ezekiel 1 verses 4 to 14, 1 verses 19 to 20, and 10 verse 12. This attempt by Muslims is to say that God is doing something wicked, and is blasphemous to say the least, in which all who do so will be held accountable for their words if they do not repent, as it reads in Exodus 20 verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Mary is always referred to as a woman, and there is no suggestion within history that Jewish women were betrothed to a husband any younger than their late teens to early 20s. Also, it was an immaculate conception, as no man was ever with Mary for the conception of Jesus. Christ also said in Luke 17 verse 2 that it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. If I were to ask a Muslim if a nine-year-old was a little one, I would assume they would say yes if twelve is rightfully seen as too young. Which was not Mary's age. After all of this being said, and arguably the main point, Muhammad is seen as the pinnacle of virtue in the Muslim world and is looked up to more than Jesus Christ. The only reason why Muslims would dare try to pursue these accusations that they have made is to excuse the detestable actions of the false prophet of Islam and not to provide a role model that is actually worth looking up to. The men documented in the Bible can be seen as role models, but they are men with their own faults and failures that the Bible truthfully reveals showing how fallen man can be and yet still showing God's grace by using them. One of the key differences between the saints of the Bible and Muhammad is that whenever the saints did something wrong, God condemned their actions accordingly. However, with Muhammad, every time he did something that was wrong, it was always coincidentally just in time for Allah to give Muhammad a revelation justifying his detestable actions. Just another hint that the Allah of Islam is not the God of the Bible. Jesus is blameless, without fault or sin, and how could you possibly do better than him? Anyone, including most Muslims, lives far better lives than even their own prophet. So why should anyone look up to a man like that? At the end of the day, Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, and you will have to answer to him one day. So make sure you get ready by accepting the price he paid for you, because your own self-righteousness is not going to cut it. Stop hiding behind a dirty false prophet and come to know the Good Shepherd today.